There he is. You're muted. We can't hear you. But we there can... I am. Okay, oh, there I'm, I'm all there now. <laughs> How are you, my friend? Thank you for joining us, Greg. I uh, I remember when I was a kid. I can remember I got you and Greg. Um, what was his name? Not not Schumacher. Um, Gus, not Gus Schumacher. Gus Schumacher. I got you yeah. and Gus Schumacher mixed up. Yeah. Uh, I didn't know. Like they're both doing agricultural stuff. I wasn't sure which one's which. And then, you know, everything you've done with New Alchemy and well, the Schumacher the, Institute, and I would just I'm really looking forward to hearing your. Well, the interesting thing is, I you know, I said Gus recommended me to replace him when he was leaving as commissioner, and I yeah. never would have never would have been commissioner had he not said, "You got to get this guy Greg yeah. to do it." So yeah, we have that, and he's poor. I mean, you know, he's passed long, passed on, but um, yeah, I miss him more than probably anybody outside of family. He was just really? such a good friend. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. Well, um, How are you? You're looking looking chipper, and after going through months and months of webinars, and this is our second, this is our penultimate, um, yeah, presentation. It's been great uh, once a week to have a, a you know somebody brilliant come and just hold forth, and then you can engage in a in a um, you know a thoughtful level dialogue for half an hour, forty five minutes. It's been a really a really enjoyable process for me. I hope for the attendees as well. Yeah, but, I'm sure it is. Yeah, I'll break that chain today. But other yeah, than I that, it will be fine. <laughs> well, I'll, uh, I'll. I usually just sort of let you take it away. Um, I'll turn my 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 camera and my sound off, and we'll reconvene in an hour or so. All right. So I can. I'm going to go share screen and put my presentation up. Is that great? Go for it. All right. We'll do it. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> See if we can't. Can you see it? We can see it. Yep. Oh, good. Okay. Let me yep. get. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. And why don't we just jump right in? Um, title of the talk is In Search of Integrity. And I'm calling to the education of a lifetime organizer. That would be me. Um, People often ask why, how African-American um, got involved in the environmental movement, especially back in the mid to late 60s, which is when I was in high school, 1967, I graduated. Um, my short answer to how and why I got involved was because I lived in Cleveland, Ohio, on the banks of Lake Erie and the Cuyahoga River. For those of you who are not familiar with the um, Ohio and Cleveland Lake Erie, uh, one of the Great Lakes was declared sort of legally dead, eutrophied. You couldn't swim in it. You couldn't bathe in it. You couldn't eat fish that were caught in it. So that was our major body of water that was off limits to those of us living in the city. The other body of water that ran through Cleveland was the Cuyahoga River. And the Cuyahoga was even um, made more infamous by the fact that it would occasionally erupt in flames. Uh, if you remember, Randy Newman made the Cuyahoga infamous with this song, Burn On Big River, but it was so polluted with uh, flammable uh, uh, liquids and pollutants that a match thrown overboard off a tug would uh, have it erupt in flames. So I, I got to know um, what it meant to have polluted bodies of water. And right before I came out east to come to um, go to school, Tufts University, headlines in our morning paper, the Cleveland Plain Dealer one morning read, Cleveland's air declared illegal. And uh, not a joke, there were a lot of jokes about Cleveland, but um, it was basically um, reporting on the fact that Cleveland air was so polluted, officials, this was one of the first times we started getting into regulating air pollution and Cleveland was, was um, ordered to clean up its, uh, its, its, its uh, air and to clean its air. And uh, they knew who the perpetrators were. They went to the factories, the, and, and basically told them, you've got, to, you've got to deal with this. But they didn't give them any specific instructions. They didn't tell them they had to do anything like install scrubbers or, 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 or cut the pollution. They left it up to the industry to do it. And basically what they did was they raised their smokestacks higher into the air and let the drifting winds carry the pollutants elsewhere. And it just so happened they carried them eastward and followed me to um, Tufts University and, and Massachusetts. So I became an early environmentalist. And when I arrived at Tufts um, wearing my environmental badge, I was taken aback when I was challenged by uh, my colleagues in the Tufts chapter of the Afro-American Society uh, about my allegiance to the environment. And they really queried me and they, they, 
ask me why it was that I, as a Black American, relatively intelligent, they thought, and somewhat articulate, would devote my time and energy to the environment. And I told them why, and I asked them why were they surprised by that. And the response, probably not a surprise to many of you, was they felt, well, maybe it will be a surprise. But I do remember Charlie Jordan, the president of the Afro-American Society, said, Greg, can you be so naive? Um, the environmental movement would not be so bad if it were merely irrelevant to our goals as African-Americans. Now, remember, this is 1967, the height of the civil rights movement, the Vietnam War, women's rights uh, movement. Uh, there was just a lot going on. And um, they, I was challenged to, for, to give them a response to how I would, my response to their challenge that the environmental movement was actually sinister and that it promoted limited growth and no growth. Limited growth and no growth, they said, where do we uh, fit into that picture? How can we as African-Americans achieve any type of economic equality uh, in that scenario? So it sounds to us as if it's a ploy to maintain the status quo. We hear similar arguments today, North, South, again, sort of as we're asking uh, the so emerging um, um, economies to not use fossil fuels after we've pretty much plundered the air so that we could build our economy. So. I, I will say that I was um, in a conundrum because I intellectually, intuitively, I felt that the twin goals of economic equality and environmental equality had to be compatible, but I didn't have an intellectual response. Uh, and I didn't get one from any of my formal schooling. And I was, even as I was at Tufts as an engineering, I still wasn't, didn't quite know how to resolve that. And um, it became economics, environment, and equity became an issue for me, as you can see in this slide. It's um, here, the, 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 the slide, the, the graphic is from um, World War II and just gives one instance uh, of how African-Americans were prevented from advancing economically along with uh, whites and others. And this happens to point out the fact that even though they served in the war, gallantly in the war, they were not eligible for uh, the benefits of the GI Bill, which was for many returning veterans, a pathway to um, the suburbs and to middle class. And so this was just sort of a blatant case. And there were others, and later on, I'll talk about it with the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. But it culminates today, and these, this, this particular quote is from a, a Boston Globe study, but it, 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 the, the fact that the median net worth of non-immigrant African-American households in Boston is $8. Eight dollars. That means any kind of uh, emergency, any kind of unexpected um, event that could happen uh, would be catastrophic. And that, by the way, compares, as you see here, to two hundred and forty-seven thousand uh, five hundred dollars net worth for white ho white households in Boston. So, how do we reconcile that? How do we deal with that? That became sort of my quest, and because I wasn't getting any real answers or resolutions via the traditional past, whether it was academic or, or, or whatever, I decided that I would venture underground. And that's when I discovered the Whole Earth Catalog. Um, the, um, I think today that was, our, that was our equivalent of the internet, the World Wide Web. Uh, it was a compendium, com compendium of tools and resources that were designed to help build um, like resilient, sustainable communities. And uh, it was, in the Whole Earth Catalog, and this was published, this was back in 1970, I believe, that I discovered the work of Buckminster Fuller. I did, I'd never heard of Bucky before. And, and um, as I read sort of the, uh, the, I think it was the inside first page that said that by Stuart Brand that said that the Whole Earth Catalog uh, was inspired by the work of Bucky. And um, that made me uh, look a little deeper into who he was. and. When I read, you know, this is just one quote that if, I hope some of you or most of you are familiar with him. This is just a brief introduction, um, but he was convinced that it was uh, and is highly feasible to take care of everybody on earth at a higher standard of living than anyone was ever known. And um, he talked about no longer having to be uh, you or me, that selfishness, war, obsolete. And he based that on two things. What he states here is sort of converting weaponry to what he called livingry. Um, but the other was sort of this, this, this understanding of, of nature's coordinate system and how nature got things done 
by resource using more resources to less resources to support greater and greater numbers of life. So greater life support, less resources. Uh, and he was determined to figure out uh, what nature strategy was. Uh, on the on the side here, you can, if you're not familiar with, with Buck, you can see a few of his inventions, the geodesic dome. This would happen to be at the Montreal World's Fair that people may be most familiar with that. Uh, he invented his own map. And it turns out it's the most accurate uh, depiction, flat map of the whole earth at one time um, it provides the um, representation and positions of the continents uh, in their proper orientation to one another and with no distortion or minimal distortion. He was able to do that by, by ingeniously sort of tucking the distortions into the ocean instead of on land. So there are distortions, but again, um, for the purposes of looking at the, 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 the planet as a whole. And by the way, what it, this perspective sort of uh, shows the the planet as a one island, one ocean earth. Um, when you look at it from that perspective, it's, it's sort of, it's an egalitarian perspective or projection in that no continent, no particular country has a privileged place. You could turn it 90 degrees to the right and then turn it 180 degrees and it's not a disorienting sort of map or depiction. So it's got a lot of interesting qualities and particularly as we start talking about how we can manage the resources for the benefit of all. He had a, during the depression came up with a vehicle, an automobile that um, on th three wheels, three, uh, um, and uh, got something like, I don't know, 11, 20 miles to the gallon, turned out not to be the most stable um, uh, uh, vehicle, but he was in his, in his quest to sort of find out and to discover the principles of, of nature, he realized that to validate his perspective, one of the things he had to do was to invent. He had to create artifacts that verified and validated a lot of his work. So that became part of his work as well. Anyway, a couple of the books on there, you may be familiar with Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. Book Synergetics, Explorations and the Geometry of Thinking, for me, sort of captures the, 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 the spirit of this, um, the whole conference and, 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 and sort of the, the merging of science and wisdom. And it is packed with both. Uh, with both. Um, Bucky says you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. And um, that became his sort of operating principle. I've tried to do that uh, during my quest to resolve these issues that I mentioned be, uh, early on, right at the beginning. Here's He took on the, the most uh, sort of the model that we're all familiar with, the Cartesian coordinates, how we sort of practice science. And these are intersecting planes that go out into infinity, he said, I don't think nature works that way. I'm gonna look at instead of uh, 90 degree uh, square planes, I'm going to look at um, 60 degree oriented hexagons that can intersect at 60 degrees in the center, but I can do that. And there are four intersecting planes. And the most important thing is they don't extend out into infinity. They close back in on themselves, which he says that infinity, when you have this, this system, this coordinate system, that sort of uh, portrays uh, uh, infinite expanse, it's almost uh, an invitation, an excuse to pollute. You, that's what we do, right? We throw it over the edge and it's gone out of sight, out of mind. But he thought there, no, that that's not the way he was convinced that nature did things. And, and further explo you know, explorations, he looked at the geometry, natural geometry of nature. And what, he's, what, what his coordinate system suggests is that we know that space is not empty. Space has structure. And he thinks that the geometry, the structure of that, of, of nature's uh, coordinate system, actually the, stru the structure of space in general, is, 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 is such that um, when you fold in and when you enclose space, which is what a system is, uh, divides inside from outside. We can do it with skin. We can do it with, 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 with uh, you know, any number of things. But um, what nature tends to do is um, use the least amount of resources to do that and the most efficient shapes that will enclose space and create systems. Um, and that was what he stood by as nature's operating um, strategy for doing more with less. Uh, he talked about a minimum toolkit of basic pattern integrities, uh, maximizing structural forms. By the way, that, that toolkit, minimum, uh, maximum diversity, minimum uh, inventory, is basically the 
periodic table, all the resources that, that are available to us to, to build whatever it is, to construct whatever it is. Everything that we do, we have physically, is uh, constructed from that uh, periodic table. Finally, he said this is scalable. You can see that these forms, these patterns, these pattern integrities, uh, maybe what Gregory Bateson would call the patterns or connect, um, exist at various scales, um, from uh, microscopic uh, all the way up to sort of the, the, the you, you galactic scale. So he was convinced, very convinced, that this was real, and it became sort of his um, the basis for his work. Now, uh, he did a lot of design work and artifacts. My my goal and my challenge was, can I take these principles, which I firmly did grasp and believe were essential to understanding how to build sustainable systems and apply them with to my work. And my work was that of a, and still is, uh, as, as an organizer. Um, and I, I, I use that term very proudly. And um, as someone who brings disparate parties together to try to solve problems um, and, or to come up with uh, designs that will address um, the needs of communities and people in communities. So um, I looked at um, areas in Boston, this is again, back in my days at Tufts that I could become involved with that made sense to me that were essential to people's lives. And it turned out, they, not as a surprise, the areas that I tended to focus on were food, energy, and shelter. And Boston was ripe with the, uh, a, 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 a culture and a community that was seriously looking at um, its um, food future, the politics of food in Massachusetts, uh, and for good reason. Um, on the, 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 the policy for food and agriculture in Massachusetts was, was developed in 1976, when at that time, Commissioner of Agriculture Fred Winthrop was, was presented with figures that startled him that showed that, that beginning at the end of the Second World War, uh, right up until the present time, the, the, the mid 70s, Massachusetts was losing farms, had lost farms and was continuing to lose farms at an alarming rate. Um, you know, 10,000 acres a year, and farms were, 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 were going down um, uh, and, and going out of business. And there was a sort of a general attitude, I think, in the legislature. Uh, There's probably no awareness or very little awareness among the public that this was going on, because as far as they were concerned, food was still coming in. And it really didn't matter if, you know, our, our supply chain was 3,000 miles or, or 4,000 miles. We were being fed until actually around two years later when we had the great... Um, uh, the, the blizzard of, of 78, that sort of changed some people's minds. But legislature sort of said, you know, well, maybe that's our fate. We'll be an industrial high-tech um, country or, or state. And we'll, we'll just, you know, again, we'll, we'll import our food whenever we need it. Fred Winthrop, Commissioner Winthrop said, no, that's not, um, that's not acceptable. And he put together a Blue Ribbon Commission um, headed by um, um, the Harvard Business School of all places. And they came up with some recommendations. The, the volume is thin. And I think it was one of the first uh, policies for food and agriculture that a state actually conducted. And it had a number of recommendations, including, among other things, the, pur the purchase of the uh, uh, ag development rights of agricultural land to try to keep our prime agricultural land from being developed. But it also included some very some things that everybody could participate in, including things like farmers markets. And so, again, this whole farmers markets, direct marketing, how to support your um, um, local farmers, but also uh, urban farming, community gardens, backyard gardens. So it became a very powerful and well-organized movement. And interesting enough, one of the people who emerged as a leader um, in the um, movement to uh, revitalize uh, our, the agricultural economy in Massachusetts was a black legislator by the name of Mel King. Mel is still very much alive and still very active. Mel, I would characterize as an ultimate you know, the, um, organizer, um, uh, visionary, um, and he championed agriculture, even though he, again, representing the South End and Roxbury um, districts of um, Massachusetts, uh, of, of, of Boston. And it, it, it's well recorded at one point, one of his colleagues, um, not so much, um, challenging him, but was trying to understand. He goes, Mel, I, for the life of me, I can't understand why you're so, so, so adamant and such a, a, such a staunch defender 
of agriculture. And Mel looked at him without blinking and, and he asked, and so why is that? And Mel said, it's because I eat. So we are now looking at, um, the, you've got a Mel King, um, a champion of agriculture in, in, in the city of Boston, and actually throughout Massachusetts, it, and he really was representing throughout Massachusetts. I was looking at this as something, yes, this is an area I wanna get involved in. There was a reality that we had to face at that time, even as we talked about supporting agriculture. And, and, and that is that there are not very many black farmers left on the land. 98% uh, of the agricultural land in, Mass in, in the United States is owned by whites. Um, and down to 2% of, of, of blacks, um, there, you know, and, and also if you include uh, people of color, that it's just a very low percentage of uh, uh, indigenous people. Um, and in the case of our Native Americans, of course, the land was taken from them, but also in the case of, of African-American black farmers, they were cheated and duped uh, out of their land as well because the percentage was much higher before. So there was that tension in terms of promoting food production, promoting agriculture, when there were clearly policies that made it difficult, if not impossible, for Blacks to, to farm the land, and which is why a lot of our focus was on the city and what we can do to farm in the city. And Boston has a rich legacy of farming in the city, um, much of it tied to the Victory Gardens, and that was done out of an intense urgency. But that legacy and that that culture of growing in the cities um, stuck. Um, and uh, uh, as a result, we had groups like the Boston Urban Gardeners emerge. And I think that the community gardening movement, not so much the backyard garden, that was, you know, people who had the backyards, that was, you, you, you got that, that's yours. But having access to some public land or, or publicly accessible land was uh, another major challenge. And so you kind of group the community gardening movement became, from my perspective, part of the struggle, part of the struggle for, for, for equality, for equity. Um, and as a result, I, I, I think that we were much better off to some extent as having to engage in the struggle because it forced us to learn the systems. Uh, it, Bucky talked about some of those natural systems that are reflected in his geometry. And one of the challenges, if you're talking about, you know, again, my focus is on systemic change, um, collaboration, um, equity, but understanding what those systems were, because for the most part, they are um, and had been uh, invisible. Um, Bucky talked a lot about making the, one of the things you want to do with your, your design process, or one of the ways that you come up with and come up with, with the, the type of sustainable and resilient designs, designs is by making the um, invisible visible. Um, and so you understand your workmen. So that became part of what we were doing uh, with the Boston Urban Gardeners. Boston Urban Gardeners was, as you'll see here, a, uh, I call it a pre-internet virtual organization community that was dedicated to helping people source, uh, secure resources to grow food in the city. And it really was a vast network and it was very diverse. It was diverse racially, it was diverse in terms of um, um, class, in terms of um, people who participated in it. Uh, the woman in the dead center there, Charlotte Kahn, along with Judy Wagner were really the, sort of the organizers, but they would tap almost anyone that they felt, well, it wasn't that they felt could contribute. They felt that everybody could contribute. So they wanted everybody to be a part of this, of this network. Um, one thing that it's, it's interesting, and it, it's an excerpt from this article that appeared in the Boston Globe was, and again, just sort of a valid or, or just emphasizing what I said before about the movement, the food movement, in, in, in the city of Boston. And if you can't read that, they just talked about there are so many city gardens, uh, gardeners in, the, um, in Boston that the US Department of Agriculture uh, created a special category for Suffolk County, that's Boston, Suffolk County. They create the urban farmer. I think a lot of folks now think that urban farming and the concept of urban farmers is sort of a new, um, new thing. But as you can see, it's been around for, for, for some time. Um, books, um, guides to gardening, um, um, newsletters came out regularly. Uh, when you see, a, whenever I saw a photo of Bug with um, the Boston River Gardeners, I realized that it changed every time because it just so happened, it, it, it happened, um, that whoever happened to be in the office at that time was corralled together for the photograph because it was such a, a fluid organization. We did a lot in terms of providing direct services to people who wanted to garden. 
when we lived in Cambridge, when and our first or expecting our first child, um, um, and uh, had our soil tested, um, went to the Suffolk County Extension Service, and that was a huge thing for the city to have. It's an extension service, right? That that again sort of uh, emphasized how strong the agriculture and the food production movement was in Boston. We found that our soil was five thousand parts per million lead. And we realized that we weren't alone. And so that also sent up the alarms, but we were grateful that we had an organization like the Boston Urban Gardeners that um, provided that kind of service and um, sent out those sorts of warnings, uh, but also then came up with ways of hope, trying to resolve it. And a lot of that, as you probably know, was to do things, we created techniques and strategies and uh, ways of growing food safely in the city when we weren't sure of what how the soil was contaminated. You had to assume, as probably most of you know, that it, it was contaminated, but we didn't know what, what the contaminants were. And then later on, as we got into more regulatory processes, you realized that you couldn't, if you tried to test and find out what was there and you found something you're responsible for cleanup. So it became a problem. Um, one of the ways, the, the temporary way of getting around that was to obviously put down barriers, you know, plastic, and then uh, bring in topsoil. A little easier said than done, but once again, this sort of shows the the ingeniousness and, and the and and uh, uh, of the Boston Urban Gardeners and their inventiveness. Um, as I said, um, Charlotte Kahn and Judy Wagner would recruit anyone, and in this case, they got the U.S. Army's um, battalion, 642nd Battalion, to move 5,000 cubic yards of topsoil from a project they were building a a biomed medical park in Worcester. And um, they got the, 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 um, the army to move and haul that topsoil from Worcester to Boston um, with the help, and you can see down below there, that picture of Lieutenant Governor John Kerry uh, at the time. So he was also, he was on the periphery, but when needed, uh, Charlotte and folks would, would, would bring him in to the fold as well. But it, uh, now today, it's sort of interesting. I, th th we also had to have a pretty good sense of where the culture was and where people were at at that time. And, and today, if you did something like this, we probably would get hauled in front of the media for uh, you know, irresponsibly using uh, um, the, 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 the armed services for this type of frivolous thing. You, you read the gauge if you're an organizer and see where 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 the, the the public is and where the media just where the but the sense of what's appropriate or not. In this case, we went ahead and it was um, um, a very successful. The one thing we did do is provide all the art the um, uh, 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 servicemen with uh, lunch and coffee. Um, here's one of the volunteers as I mentioned, corralling everyone. That's Susan Redlick, who was the director of the Massachusetts Division of Land Use, and this guy Jack Powers handing out the the coffee was a poet. He owned the Stone Soup Bookstore. They could find a role for everyone um, to, to play. Uh, the garden parties were held. They did a big fundraising effort. The idea was actually, no, we've got to secure land and turn that land into permanent uh, urban agricultural land trust. I'm not sure if we were the first, but certainly we're among the first sort of to take this route. We would work with the Boston Redevelopment Authority um, BRA and identify parcels of land throughout the city that were either too small or situated in such a such a way that they were obviously not going to be developable. And we made a pitch um, to package them, and we held fundraisers and dances and 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 raffles and whatever, and and started to put that land into um, permanent um, uh, agricultural land use, which was amazing and. By the way, we were um, very good at celebrating and acknowledging successes. Um, we also did acknowledge when things didn't go well, but I think it more importantly here, it's, it's, it's critically important to, uh, to, to celebrate and to acknowledge. And you know, uh, uh, when successes are made and, to, uh, and to, for people to um, not only understand that success, um, I think what, one of the things that Charlotte and others are very good at was also helping them to connect and see how it was impacting other parts of the city and other residents. So this, once again, this systemic or the systems perspective was, was, was very important. Um, we experimented and tried to do um, whatever we could to make these gardens 
work and some of it was extraordinary and out of the ordinary. This happens to be the Christian Herder Center, a, a public facility on the um, Brighton, Alston area on the Charles River. Um, we were working, this is Jack Powers, the same guy that was handing out the, the coffee there on the lower left-hand side uh, with a, a group of teens on a summer project. Um, the, I, we were tasked with building a barbecue for the Christian Herder Center. One of the young women, Gina, up top there noticed that the gardeners were hauling water from inside the Christian Herder Center across, I don't know, a few hundred yards to water, uh, provide water for the garden. And she thought that that was, you know, why is that happening? Um, Jack and I sat down with the group and said, what do you, do you have any ideas of what, uh, for a solution? And one of the, um, one of the young men said, well, you know, well, let's dig a well. Literally said, let's dig a well. And so we decided we would do it. Now we were on the Charles River. We probably knew that there was going to be some water there, but the Charles River wasn't the most clean, wasn't the cleanest body of water. Um, we wanted to get the kids really psyched and we invited a um, Vermont dowser to come down and talk to us about dowsing. Um, I think Gina was the one that really got into it, took to it. That, uh, that's a little coat hanger thing there. She started surveying the grounds, found a place for us to dig the augers, uh, the whole bit. We actually did get the, um, the, the well dug. By the way, we also didn't know afterwards, we were asked, did we get any kind of permits to do this? And um, we didn't even think about that, not even consider that that might be something that had to be done. So that was one of the, you know, one of your strategies sometimes is um, you, you act and you apologize later. But in this case, it really was sort of a naivete, but it was fine. Uh, Gary Hirschberg, who some of you may know is the founder of Stonyfield Yogurt and the uh, former director of the New Alchemy Institute, um, saw what we were doing and um, proposed that they would put up a cell wing wind windmill, which they did, to pump the water. So networking, connections, innovation, things that you don't expect to see in the city were happening on a, on a, on a regular basis, and they were empowering. People felt that they were um, not victims, that they were developing skills. And, um, and, it, it, and again, that's sort of when you, you think about systemic change, some of it is really going after the, 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 the parts of the system that are creating uh, hardship or, or, or um, prejudice against particular people. But the other part of that system is how do you bring people up? How do you get them to, to feel good about themselves in the face of adversity and um, coming up with these solutions and strategies was, was part of it. Uh, this guy, once again, Mel King, I can't say enough about him and the role that he played in his vision. He, he was talking permaculture back, um, back in, the, you know, in, the, in the 60s and 70s. He um, got the legislature to provide, a Massachusetts legislature to provide money to create a fruition um, program and planted fruit trees all throughout Massachusetts and including a number of them right in the city. Uh, and some of those orchards still exist. And there's some out in, I know at the New England Small Farm Institute in, in Belchertown, but he was um, an incredible visionary and um, very strong, very soft-spoken, very strong, but also very gentle. But he, he, he knew what, um, what needed to be done. And by the way, he had a community fellows program um, where he had mid-career um, young black men and women um, come, he, he, he taught at MIT, professor at MIT, and they would um, um, uh, talk about what sort of career opportunities or type of mid-career options and opportunities existed for them. I'm getting a little ahead of my story, but one of the first places that Mel would bring them was a, a place called the New Alchemy Institute. And I'll talk about that in just a, just a little bit. And I'll tell you why he would bring them there. Um, in the midst of all this, and this is like now we're getting into the to late 70s, just to kind of give you a cultural um, context, social economic context for what was going on. Boston was in the midst of court ordered busing and it was messy and it was nasty and it was violent. Um, um, again, ostensibly to try to, once the issues of equality were, were at, at the core of what people were trying to, uh, or at least what folks were allegedly trying to address, but I personally couldn't quite see what was accomplished by 
taking kids from one neighborhood um, and a poor school and a, and a, a poorly endowed and resource school to uh, another community that was equally um, resource poor, um, um, miles away from their home um, for the sake of, of, of integrating. I think what most, at least from what I would hear from folks, what was people were looking for was um, um, quality education. But, but nonetheless, that was going on. And I bring that up because um, I, I was working at a bookstore and I happened to see an ad for jobs at a place called the Thompson Island Education Center, which is a 175 acre island just off the coast of, of, of South Boston, or Boston in general, but very close to South Boston, which was where the busing uh, was one of the epicenters of, of, the, of, of the busing um, tension. And um, they were, uh, when things were so bad at the high school that it was thrown into receivership. The court took it over and alternative programs were established. Um, they were hiring teachers, they wanted to set up an, a, a, an integrated um, interdisciplinary environmental studies course for these, for these kids. And so um, I applied 50 bucks a week um, uh, and um, got the job. And um, I'm bringing this up because it was an incredible uh, education more for me, I think, than for the kids. We did a lot with them. We once out of the environment um, of the hostile environment, that was mainland Boston, um, they were more than willing to work together and play together. As a matter of fact, um, went out of their way to do that. We were challenged to come up with a community, um, island community project for them to do. Um, people were questioning their ability to work together. So they wanted to do something, the, the administration of the island, do something fairly simple, like a, um, fairly simple, like a, a, a nature trail which they already had, uh, for some reason we decided, um, or someone came up with the idea of building, I don't know if people know what that is, that's standing on the uh, wharf there. Some of you probably will recognize what it is. Maybe some are still scratching your head. It's a, it's a windmill, Savonius windmill, vertical axis windmill. And one of the reasons that we came up with that is because we, uh, we had 55 gallon drums that had floated onto the onto the shore and they were rusted, but those were really sort of the turbine blades. We challenged the kids to, um, well, they kind of challenged us to do this. Um, and um, the interesting thing was none of us had it any, none of, I don't think this would come as a surprise. None of us had ever built a Savoni, any kind of windmill before. And so we built it together with the students. And when it was all said and, and done, it actually, it, it, it worked, I mean, it was, it was a success. And these kids really were proud of themselves as they should have been, but their pride was even expanded more when a boatload of college kids from UMass Boston got off the boat for one of the day trips on Thompson Island at that point. And they stood around looking at this thing and had no idea what it was. And when one of the kids said, it's a windmill, they said, no, you're kidding. And you had these South Boston kids who had, you know, again, uh, had been under so much pressure and explaining and describing to these college kids how their windmill worked. And it was worth the price of admission. It was worth the price of doing the whole thing just to see the looks on their faces as they were um, um, explaining and describing the, um, the, um, the qualities and benefits of, of wind energy to these college students. Now I bring that up, so it, right in the midst of this, um, Susan Redlick, who I also pointed out handing out coffee to the, to the uh, uh, armed battalion there, um, for bringing in the topsoil, approached me actually on the island. She took the boat over and asked if I would be interested in organizing um, Boston, uh, farmers markets in, in the greater Boston municipal um, area. And this was part of that orange, that green, the, the, the plan, as I mentioned, for revitalizing Massachusetts agriculture. Part of what we wanted to do was preserve uh, prime farmland, which was the most important thing, right? The resource has got to be there. But the other part was you don't want to just preserve farmland. You want to preserve farmers and farm businesses. And so direct marketing became a, um, a major objective. It, and roadside stands, pick your own. But, but Commissioner Winthrop and others realized farmers markets, the oldest marketing system in the world, but that direct marketing um, um, system was something that um, we needed to try to revitalize. There were rural farmers markets for sure out in the rural areas where they're selling to each other, 
but we did not have any city markets. As a matter of fact, I think Green Market in New York uh, was one of the sparks that, that inspired us because it was a huge uh, farmer's market that was attracting farmers from far away as the Carolinas, I think, to come up to New York because of the, the volume of people there. Um, we clearly were not looking to that. We were looking to see if we could um, do that, uh, just encourage um, uh, uh, folks within the greater uh, Boston area, but also provide farmers with high volume so that they could make a, in four hours do a pretty good job. Really quickly, we organized these markets, did you know, work with the high school student, Michael Grunbaum. He and I were the farmer's market staff at that time, hired by Susan Redlick. We got everything up and going. We got um, the schedules out. We recruited farmers. Uh, July 7th, um, 1978, we had 20 farmers said they were going to come in to um, um, uh, uh, Dorchester, um, Fields Corner. Um, for our market, we rallied around. We got the news there. We got Commissioner of Agriculture, Lieutenant Governor. Um, we had tons of people. The market opened at nine o'clock and not a single farmer showed up. Not a single farmer. And 9.15, not a farmer showed up. Right around 9.20, the guy up there in the left, uh, up in the top of the screen, Cachadora Barbarian from Northborough, his wife and daughter rumbled down uh, Dorchester Avenue and parked their truck and they were mobbed by the crowd. And the, the news media was good to us. Rather than take a wide angle shot and show one truck in the middle of the street, they, they did a close up. And the, the hands were moving so fast, they couldn't, they couldn't get the sign off of their truck. They were selling their, their, their produce so, so quickly. Um, that night when it aired on TV, the, their buddies saw this and decided that they would come in. The reason they didn't come in is they were afraid. They were afraid. Things were so bad in Boston with the, with, with the busing. They didn't, there was a, it was when they ever, the only time they came into the city was to drop off stuff at the wholesale market. They had, most of them had never spent any time. And so they admitted in some of them that we were afraid to come in. We saw Catchy. And I will tell you, he probably, I won't say he saved the market, but we probably would have lost that year had not he shown up. And by the way, that's him in, in 2010, still selling at the farmer's markets. This happened to be a Brookline market. But I think if someone were asked, were the market successful, that they really helped the farmers, you can come up with a lot of statistics. But I think the fact that Ketchy had been there all those years was uh, a, 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 an indication that it was. And real quickly, we, we are still, we are now experiencing some issues of, of, of um, inclusion at some of the markets as the long, some of the clientele at the markets, the foodies have sort of become the more dominant consumers. They've gotten a little bit impatient with some of the, and the coupon programs that have been established to help low-income folks uh, purchase food at, at farmer's markets. Language barriers have created tension. Um, we were noticing this, um, particularly the Massachusetts Food System Collaborative. So we were, not forced, but we took the initiative to conduct some workshops on inclusion um, and try to figure out what can be done to stave off uh, what was a disturbing trend. And I think things have been done uh, to that end, but I, it just goes to, once again, demonstrate that you, uh, um, things never stay the same. Things aren't static and things are dynamic. And as popularity grows, we have to sort of try to meet those head on. I mentioned the New Alchemy Institute real quick. It was a um, I, I, I add to uh, for an education director at this place called the New Alchemy Institute. When I first saw it, uh, the ad Susan Redlick passed it on to me. I thought this looks pretty good, but is this like really a commune? I'm not sure. I really really want to do this, but it was a cutting edge organization, uh, think do tank on Cape Cod, where I still live after having worked there that was doing the pioneering work in areas of organic agriculture, aquaculture, passive solar design, permaculture. John Todd, Nancy Todd, Bill McClarney, the co-founders, saw again, were, were impressed by Earth Day and the, the interest, growing interest in environmental issues. But they were basically saying most of the emphasis, most of the attention, as it should be, was, was focused on what was wrong, fossil fuels and pesticides and herbicides. No one was coming up with so better the better model, as Bucky said. So the New Alchemy Institute came into being research project, organic farming and all. And it really was an, um, a 12 acres abandoned dairy farm. Um, this was as close as I came to sort of being a farmer. <laughs> and, and I bring that up only because of the work as, as Department of Agriculture. But we were, once again, looking at, um, the, the, you know, cutting edge technologies like the, the dome 
not because the dome was cool, but because as Bucky would say, it's the, the, one of the most efficient structures that you can build in terms of the way, you know, it encloses the maximum amount of inside volume and uses the least amount of surface area to do it. So if you're talking about housing or greenhouse, or whatever, and you're talking about uh, resource um, efficiency, you want to build structures that are strong and stable, but use the least amount of resources. And you can see this, the, the, this dome really could stand close to hurricane force winds when we had our agro and, you know, we were growing uh, fruiting uh, fig trees inside, not because it was the best thing to do, but it was a demonstration of the way that we could keep the, how we could keep it warm, even, on, you know, Cape Cod is not as cold as some parts of Massachusetts, but it, it does get cold. But you can see when we had to move it, we could get about 30 people, pick the thing up, move it to another site, wrap the bungee cords around the, the cement blocks, cinder blocks, and, and bury them. We also had the, the thing, the, a place called the Cape Cod Ark, which did pioneering work in, in um, what is now called aquaponics. We didn't have a name for it then, it was just integrated um, aquaculture and agriculture. Um, we talked about big ideas like the villages of solar ecology and conf a conference there. Um, I undertook an initial study working with folks on looking at Cape Cod as a bioregion and work with the University of Massachusetts uh, Studio Landscape Architecture Regional Planning. And so we, we did sort of a study looking at the uh, Cape. And Cape is, you know, it is a peninsula, it's a sole source aquifer um, that serves everybody, all uh, towns on, on Cape Cod. So it became sort of a very interesting um, um, way of looking at um, the Cape as a bioregion. The concept had just, I, I think, um, what had long been in circulation in terms of bioregion. So we were sort of on the cutting edge of that. We brought in a guy by the name of Arthur Palmer who did uh, zoning um, based on um, ecological um, principles instead of uh, just pure political. We were involved in the, one of the first conferences that was held at uh, University of Massachusetts, but we had worked with the National Audubon Society Expedition Institute and one of the first uh, conferences on is the Earth of Living Organism. So it was one of the first Gaia uh, conferences. Um, I left New Alchemy after then three years and stunned some of my colleagues and folks when I went to work for state government and they couldn't believe that that after these years of working at this an idyllic place, bucolic place uh, where we were doing this work, why would I want to go and work for government? And I, I honestly, the reason was one, I was offered, uh, Evelyn Murphy, Secretary of Economic Affairs, at the time had this idea, Evelyn Murphy had seen me at the farmer's markets. And she says, I need someone to come and help me um, with these ideas for economic development in Massachusetts. One of them was called the Centers of Excellence, where we're putting together industry, academia, government, creating partnerships and collaborations, looking at um, anticipating what some of the next areas of economic growth based on technology could be that were sustainable. We didn't talk about resiliency so much, we're talking about economics but biotechnology to some extent, solar panels, solar photovoltaics was, was one. We worked with groups down in Southeastern Mass, particularly uh, Marine Electronics, Sipican, that was looking to wean itself from uh, doing uh, defense contracts to doing things like developing uh, monitoring systems for um, bodies of water, the ocean and all. So we were, it was a pretty heady thing and it was very um, uh, exciting. Um, there was sort of a vacuum there. And this is what one of the things you understand systems. And I kind of, I keep pressing that, but it's important. And I realized, you know, um, I proposed to, to, to the governor, Mike Dukakis at the time and secretary Evelyn Murphy, that we needed a, 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 an office of um, science and technology. And uh, I love the name Massachusetts, most Massachusetts Office of Science and Technology. So we created it and I became the first and uh, sadly to say only um, director of the Massachusetts Office of um, Science and Technology, but we did some pretty interesting things. We, 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 we published um, a um, newsletter called Sustainability. And this was, as you can see down there in 1989, this issue was devoted to climate change. We hosted a state house climate change conference uh, hosted, co-hosted by the Secretary of Economic Affairs at that time, it had become Joe Alviani and the Secretary of State, but it also gave me sort of license to go and uh, participate in um, climate change competence around the country and a couple of them elsewhere because we were committed to doing this. So when part of this education, part, and, and by the way, the other reason for accepting the invitation to come to work in the state after having been at New Alchemy was that I needed to know um, 
or wanted to know, um, could these arguments be made to the non-converted? And while it was always pleasing and it was gratifying when you had these huge crowds show up every Saturday for our, our tours and um, they were just in awe of what was going on and so supportive, it, that was good. But at the same time, to me, a real challenge was, okay, I, I believe this, I'm convinced, I know it works. And what we, what we knew at that time, I think you guys are doing a lot more of what we didn't do. We were looking at the, purely at the technical feasibility of these concepts, like the, um, the, the passive solar architecture and the organic farming, the raised beds and all that. Um, to be honest, we weren't as interested, I'll just put it that way, in the economics, we probably should have been, but we were gung-ho on proving um, the, the concept which was one of the things I will say that 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 made Gary Hirschberg a little impatient because he felt that he he was an entrepreneur. He, he finally left and went on to do the the Stonyfield yogurt. Um, that was that. So uh, running quickly forward, I, I did another stint quick at, at the New Alchemy Institute. This was after serving in state government for a number of years uh, on Massachusetts Office of Science and Technology. John Quinney left as the executive director. Um, I was asked to, if I'd be interested in, in coming back to. New Alchemy executive director. I did that in 1989. Here's sworn in Michael Dukakis. But shortly after that, um, he appointed, um, I should put, say, he appointed me on the right there as commissioner of agriculture. And this was sort of a surprise to everybody, mostly me um, being, um, and, and I, I was, be, I, I became commissioner because um, the governor got a recommendation from the outgoing commissioner, Gus Schumacher, who had to go back to the World Bank. He was on leave from the World Bank. Gus would regularly show up with his brother, uh, his brother's stall at the uh, farmer's market in Brookline and um, sell. And he was so impressed with the farmer's market, he and I would get in these conversations. I didn't know who he was at the time. Turns out he was commissioner. And when he left, he suggested to Mike Dukakis, this is the person you want as commissioner. He's not a farmer, but He's an advocate, did the farmer's markets. He's a consumer. Mike Dukakis loved it. And it was um, at this particular time, 1989, even the Massachusetts Farm Bureau and others were recognizing we've got to start to um, reach out more to the environmental community. We know that there are all, all sorts of questions about our practices and the impact that we're having. We, 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 and so when I talked to Gordon Price, the, 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 the director of the Farm Bureau, he says, can we create some sort of dialogue? Can we start talking about what this means? And he, the last thing he asked me was, does the sustainable necessarily mean organic? And I said, we'll, we'll talk about definitions. But, um, and as a result of that, they supported my becoming commissioner as well. One of the first groups that corralled me um, um, after um, becoming commissioner, um, actually it was, uh, this was a little while after. What happened was Mike Dukakis appointed me he left office. There was a, and, and so uh, really months after he became, um, uh, after appointing me, um, he had to leave. And so 1990, there was a race for governor. Um, um, Bill Well uh, became um, the, uh, eventually became the new governor. He was of a different party. He is a Republican. But in the interim, as he was running and I was commissioner, and no one knew what was going to happen. Um, the Dairy Farmers, Mass Association of Dairy Farmers, asked me to come out and visit them. And they wanted to talk about their plight in terms of dairy pricing. And they got me to come out to, I think it was, um, oh my God, way out in, in Western Mass, um, Hancock, Massachusetts. I think of Donnie Leib's farm, Gordy Price, others, or, or Gordy Cook and others were there. And so they, when I first arrived, they were all sitting at the picnic table, their caps pulled down over their, their eyes, kind of frowns on their faces, waiting for me. I drive up, um, sit down start to talk. The first thing one of the farmers asked me, I think it was Donnie Lee. He looked at me and said, so commissioner, um, what do you know about dairy? And um, my grandmother taught me well. She said, you should never lie. And so it took me probably three seconds to say nothing. And I was waiting for their reaction, didn't know what it was going to be. And Gordy Cook's face broke out in a big smile. And he goes, great. Will you listen to us? We have, we've got a problem. We think we have a solution. We need somebody who will just listen. Long story short, we, they, they had this idea of how to talk about systemic change again. They felt that the federal milk marketing order, the federal structure that, um, that regulated 
the price of milk. Dairy farmers don't have any control unless you unless you bottle your own. But for the most part, dairy farmers, Massachusetts, New England, anywhere in the country, cannot um, have no control over the price they charge for milk. It's all federally regulated. Unfortunately, the formula for determining that price is is is, is based on some arcane process that includes um, the price of block cheese in Wisconsin and your your uh, uh, in, in, in Chicago and your distance from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. And what it boiled down to in essence was that a Massachusetts dairy farmer was waking up at this particular time in the morning, realizing that no matter how hard they worked, no matter what they did, um, they were gonna lose money. And so what they proposed was a way of um, overriding the federal milk marketing order. And I got all sorts of, 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 of warnings from other commissioners and secretaries of agriculture. You gotta stay away from dairy, gotta stay away from dairy. Um, we decided, we, I, I figured, what the heck? I, 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 I don't want this to be a career. This is something that is important. They've asked me, um, their constituents. And so I said, I would help them. Um, and but I said, but I don't know if I'm gonna be, how much longer I'm gonna be commissioner. Three days later, I get a, um, a call from Bill Weld's office, the newly elected governor asking me to come. I thought he was gonna say, this is it. You're, um, um, would you, you know, I'm, I know a lot of people who would like to be commissioner, change a party. But he looked at me and said, do you want to stay? And I said, I would. And then he kind of smiled, but then kind of pulled it back in. And he said, OK, call them off. I said, excuse me? He said, call them off. And I said, what do you mean? He says, the damn dairy farmers. They've been calling me and lobbying me. He says, I don't know why. But anyway, long story short, they got me probably more than else to get back um, to take a sec to, to continue and finish my term as commissioner. We pursued it. We actually did get a, a, a pricing order put in place that was actually helping the dairy farmers by placing a surcharge on the on the processors, the Westland Creameries, the, the hoods that would, whenever the price, the federal price of milk fell below the cost of production. And we held hearings, we held, so the farmers would come in, we got their data so that we could actually verify. We did a whole lot and we got it done. We were challenged in the US Supreme Court and we lost and we lost um, big time, something like nine to two. But I will say that even in that loss, what, what did happen that was powerful and still there was that the dairy farmers, and I'll use the term, they organized, they worked together, which is something that is difficult for dairy farmers because of just the nature of their work and the nature of what dairy farming is. It's you know round the clock and it's 20, uh, 365 days uh, um, a year and you've got to do everything from you know, animal husbandry to carpentry to metal work and whatever, but they they were they came together, and that probably to this day I will tell you probably scared the 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 processors, and not so much all of them because some were actually on our side. I would get calls from Garlic Farms. I say you're doing the right thing. Um, the, this lawyer's journal makes it sounds like it's all about milk and money, but it really was about more than that, including empowerment. I'm going to hurry up here and go through. The, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, which was again, sort of um, where I learned the systems of how um, unscrupulous people could control land. And, and as you're seeing now happening, playing out today, things like um, um, voting districts of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, uh, of, uh, a multicultural community in the heart of Roxbury, Cape Verdean, Latino, African-American um, and uh, white. Um, the one thing they had in common was they were poor. It used to be a middle-class Jewish community, but um, a lot of folks took advantage of that GI Bill that I mentioned earlier. If you were white and they fled, they got out of the city, took advantage, got their homes in the suburbs, started the middle-class life. And this core became very poor. Um, it became a target for um, urban renewal. Um, the city had a plan for marinas and condominiums. Um, most of the residents, their term, I think it was actually... Uh, James Baldwin um, talked about um, uh, urban renewal as Negro removal. They saw that there was no place for them. And so they resisted the, that from happening. And as a result, the, um, the landowners and the slumlords, in terms of minimizing their losses, torched their buildings to collect insurance. And the place was reduced to rubble. As a matter of 1,400 vacant lots, all those this is the, called the Dudley Triangle. This is a picture of the heart of, of Roxbury and all that's in black were, were burned out, burned to the ground um, um, of lots. And it looked like a war zone. Um, I'm gonna jump ahead real quick and show you that, that as a result of some incredible um, visioning and planning 
Um, they converted a lot of that vacant land into affordable housing. They found a way to stabilize that uh, the prices and to prevent um, what, what they did was using community land trust um, and, and being able to manipulate the value of the property, primarily um, keeping it lower uh, than market value for resale over a longer period of time, they, they, um, um, uh, they staved off the, the developers, speculators who wanted to come in and take it. They had to take a hit as well because they, they, weren't, they, weren't, being able, they weren't maximizing their profit or their value of the land. They were optimizing it. And in the process, they decoupled um, gentrification, which was desirable, from displacement, which is something that most folks felt you, you couldn't do. They did it with a plan. Um, it was community-based. A community was in, thoroughly involved. Um, visioning process. Um, I mean, we probably kept post-its in business over the years. Um, urban agriculture was a major part of it. We even flirted with the uh, my current um, place of business, the EF Schumacher's local currency. Um, they have bird shares. We tried to do something like that. We just didn't have the critical mass to do it. Agriculture became a central part of the revitalization of this community. We had an old um, commercial garage that had been sitting around for a long time, leak, still leaking oil. I think it was polluted. Uh, we got money from the Mass Highway Department, Environmental Supplemental Fund. It was about a $1.9 million. We applied. We got it. We could take this, um, tore down this garage. We had a long time negotiating with them because they said uh, we wanted to build a, a, a greenhouse. And they said, well, we, we're the highway department. We build horizontal. We don't build vertical. And we really had to and really work hard to get them to accept our plan, put the community greenhouse in place. And um, we partnered with the food project um, that did training and uh, education for young farmers. Um, and the, the project has been an incredible success. Dudley Neighbors Incorporated is the land trust that um, operates, controls the land. Um, and, you know, again, that, that was a difficult thing for a lot of folks to kind of come to grips with is that you don't own the land, but you, uh, you do own the property. You get a 99 year lease. Culturally, we had to do some work with, you know, the various cultures, Latino, Af Cape Verdean and African American to talk about what this land trust was. It still is a bit of a shame that in order to make this work though, we have to say to folks that you sacrifice some of um, the value. Um, but the important thing is collectively, collaboratively, they did it. They did it to preserve their community. They did it for each other. And they were willing to sacrifice personal gain, maximizing personal gain in order to benefit the entire community. And if we don't think that that's important, then we're sort of in, in the wrong business. Just going to go through these real quick. But Food Project is there. That cutting gives you, uh, once again, city of the, uh, what the city is doing. Um, the, the press really picks up on this, right? They're taking root. We got the urban gardening going thing here. Uh, Article 89 was incredibly important. Mayor Menino saw what was going on. He literally wanted to make uh, urban agriculture, urban agriculture, not urban farming, part of his legacy. So what he did was 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 uh, direct the um, the Boston Redevelopment Authority and his planners to zone the city of Boston for commercial farming. And that when you know you don't exist, you you're, you're not real in a city if there's no zoning for you. For him to do that, and it was a two year process public process, going through every single line, every conceivable thing that related to agriculture. I mean, it was like microscopic, but it was once again, for people who participated, they were participating and understanding and learning the system and how to work that system. So it was an amazing thing. You've got groups now that are taking the baton from old folkies like me and folks like the New Alchemy Institute, the Urban Farming Institute, they are now taking the lead. They've got this incredible place in Mattapan that used to be a farm. Um, and Mattapan used in Roxbury used to be on the outskirts of, 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 um, of, uh, of Boston. And they were the places where people went to vacation on the farm. There's now an annual urban farming conference. Um, and we've got to look at, uh, you know, sort of innovations. And, and some of these are created some tension once again, because some of these innovations like freight farms can environmentally controlled um, 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 uh, um, um, facilities. Um, um, are very capital intensive. We're finding young folks coming in once again from outside the city, taking advantage of what's been done in terms of um, the groundwork for uh, welcoming and encouraging food, um, of farming, commercial farming in Boston. Uh, but it's, it's certainly out of reach for 
a lot of the low income folks who, who, who live there. Um, at the same time, I will say, um, sadly, we've got to be thinking about investing, experimenting with climate controlled food production because um, after Ida and others, it's really clear we, we are, we're not prepared. We're, we're, adapt, adaptation is just not even on the radar screen in terms of what nature is doing and how nature is going to uh, uh, write things from her perspective. Um, and we've got to sort of be prepared. I'm going to sort of end with, you know, we, one of the things as, as I came over from the Department of Ag um, and uh, to the Schumacher Center, one of the things that, well, actually I was still on the board of the, of the Schumacher Center as commissioner of agriculture, starting our funded ag urban agriculture program, which is what I did during my second stint as commissioner, 20 years after my first stint. Um, and this was like in, in, in 2012, finishing up the term of, of, of Scott Soares. But um, when I was at one of our board meetings and uh, one of the board members asked me, what's the best example? He said, you're doing this urban agriculture program. What are the models? Where do you, where's the best example of successful urban agriculture? And thanks to my son, who was a self-taught um, student of the um, Cuban revolution, he said, pops, you got to tell them they got to go to Cuba. So we did. We got a, we, we took a, um, a mission. We take, uh, took a, 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 a delegation to look at the sustainable, resilient food systems in Cuba. As most of you probably know, the, the, the interesting thing, one of the most interesting things about what happened in Cuba in terms of their uh, agroecology uh, was the fact that it was born totally out of necessity after you know, the Soviet collapse, no oil, no fossil fuel you know, of any kind, no pesticides, and they were starving. Cubans were losing 15 to 20 pounds on average per year because of the lack of food, and they were directed, find a way to grow without food and um, and because they didn't have the oil for transporting it from the western part of the of the island, uh, where there was rich agricultural land, they they obviously said well, you've got to grow as much as possible as close to the city, if not within the city, as possible. So not only was there agroecology, but the whole urban agriculture movement was born. But there was also a bit of a structure. The the, the Cuban government let up on them and allowed them to experiment with cooperatives and. And 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 teacher and farmer to farmer teaching almost to replace um, the the, uh, the the traditional extension sort of service and that was of tremendous interest to the black farmers because some of our black farmers from the south who came on a couple of our our tours said they aren't allowed to join the co-ops down south and they're trying to start their own so that was very interesting to be a part of that I'm no longer involved with that but it's still going on um, uh, with folks at the University of Massachusetts. And I'm going to end by just saying, so all this is coming together. Uh, the culmination of all this and, and sort of the, the pulling together of the, these, these genius strategies for, and, but driven by the grassroots, by in, empowering people and networking, collaborating, being innovative, daring to be naive, have led to some amazing um, results, some amazing innovations. And they're local. Um, it's clear, as I kind of alluded to with Ida and others that um, we've got some serious problems that we're going to have to literally deal with like tomorrow and they are global in scope and they're probably going to be to some extent uh, global in terms of their solution. So as I, as I, as I start to look at, uh, you know, spending more and more time with my, my grandchildren, getting out of the day-to-day -day work that has been so really, and for me, uh, invigorating, and, and I just feel very fortunate to have been able to do uh, what I've been able to do over the years. But in my final sort of swan song, uh, we've, we've gotten the, uh, the trademark and intellectual property rights to resurrect what Buckminster Fuller called the World Game Workshop, was a, which is a, a tool, an educational tool, simulation, global simulation designed to promote, encourage, promote global collaboration on a number of issues and, and energy being one. I'm going to stop there and um, say that's sort of our the next goal. That will be what I will focus on till who knows when. So from that, I'll just leave you with find the shortest, simplest way between the earth, the hands, and the mouth. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. And I'm sorry we didn't have enough time for the whole story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, kind of, yeah, kind of. Schumacher Society didn't even get touched. I mean, really, but, but the, his whole work and all that piece. Yeah, um, it's it's um, it's wonderful just to hear 
you know, what one person can do in their life if they're if they're have passion and you know um, conviction. Um, I mean, you've been. I, I it's almost like your Forrest Gump. At least for me, in the sort of ecosystem of the movement here in New England and Massachusetts, you know what? <laughs> what have you not? What have you not done? So, well, um, you know, and but but it is it, it, it and it's interesting. You're right. It is you you do make a commitment to say what can one person do. But in doing that, you say, but I know I can't do it alone, right? But but it, it is sort of that whole. But you can take the initiative if you're, uh, and this is important, if you're willing to fail, <laughs> I mean, you've got to do that. If you're, if you say to yourself, I'm not concerned with carving out a career necessarily, yeah. but I am looking to see if there's a way to make an impact. You, you would be amazed at what you can, and also if you don't mind being a little poor every once in a while. <laughs> so that, that also factors in, right? I think it, it, there's some very important lessons there. If you want to just tease them out for a minute or two, um, certainly people should feel free to to pose questions. I've got a couple affirmations, but yeah, uh, I think you what know, is it? There's, a, there's an important life lesson here about what you have done and how and what is what is this, the frame of mind that um, one needs to be in? You know what what what? I'm getting... <laughs> well, no, you know, again, when when when. I sort of, I, I didn't know that I was starting on any kind of a journey, obviously. I mean, this was just sort of, you know, you know I'm, I'm looking and seeing some very interesting things that were happening in Boston. Um, there's no question that, that um, the, my connection with Fuller, and I, don't, I think different people have, there are different paths, always different paths of sort of how and what it is that sort of gets you committed to doing what it is that you do. But but mimicking or, or, or echoing what you said a little, you just said, Dan, he, his whole life was that what can one individual do on behalf of humanity that governments and large corporations are unable to do? And part of what that was for, from his perspective was you can take the initiative. If you, once again, and, and this whole idea of failing or making mistakes and and again i did this wasn't just from him but it was sort of like captured in that you know it, it, i think his words were if you don't make mistakes you don't make anything and don't don't look at mistake mistakes he says every time you do something and it doesn't work you've learned something it's it's part of it that's not an un, it's not an unlearning process you, you just have a and it's not it's not rose colored glasses you actually adopt you see the world differently you just see the world differently. And for me, every opportunity was, um, and I'll, I'll say this, and it may strike folks as being sort of weird, but what would happen was when, some, when, when Susan Redlick proposed and said, look, we want to start these farmer's markets in Boston. And I, I'm not making this up. And we were sitting on the boat coming from Taunton Island. She said, so, um, and she knew me through the Boston Urban Gardens. Just not that well, but we were networked together, right? And she said, so we want to start these farmers markets. And I, I, I think you would be a person that could help us do that. So are you interested? And I looked at her and said, I think so, Susan, tell me what a farmer's market is. And so she, and she <laughs> did, right? She described it and it wasn't that difficult. I kind of thought I knew, but you know, I didn't, I didn't know what a farmer, you know. It's good to be humble. Happen. It's good not to presume. Yeah. That's, that's a good not to presume. <laughs> and in, in, in that instance, and I didn't even get into the, the whole offshore wind thing because I wanted to stick to food because that was another, that was like 11 years, right? Just trying to get the offshore wind industry off the ground. But in each instance, when someone described to me, honestly, I had to see it. If, if in my mind's eye, as they were describing it, I, and I don't mean seeing how I was going to do it, but I had to see it. I mean, and so yeah. she would describe it and I could see, I mean, the farmer's market wasn't that difficult and even an offshore wind you know, but I, but it's more than, it's more than a visual thing. I think maybe what I should have said is I need it. You have to see it and you have to feel it. And mm -hmm. you almost like have to be, you know, you, if you know what I mean, you're almost there. And so I, even without knowing anything else, I say, yes. And, and because then I do think that where the systems thinking and construct and the way of seeing the world works is, you know, what you have to learn. You know what you, first of all, you know what you know, and you really do know what you don't know. And I think in just in terms of framing, right, where, where, where am I right now? Yeah. And um, I found, I, I did find that it, and it's important when you're trying to do things like working, you representing, the commissioner of agriculture is a big deal for farmers. I didn't realize, 
that's that, a responsibility. I mean, that's a that's a that's cabinet level. I mean, that's <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah. but but it, it's even a bit more. I I I when we were working on our sort of the dairy pricing deal, and um, there was one farmer we had we came up. A, one sticking point was we were going to you know charge surcharge to the the Westland Crimiers and all uh, a, a fee, and that would come back to farmers. But we had to cap it. We didn't want we didn't want this government subsidy to encourage people adding cows to the herd because we had this money. So we said we're going to go back to a certain time in history and we're going to cap it. And there was one farmer who just felt that that was unfair, and so um, he said he wanted to talk. And I said, and he was really angry. I said, well, can I? I'll come to your farm. And he said, yeah, you can come. And so I, 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 we're ready for like this huge thing. I drive up to the farm. He greets me as I get out of my car. We start walking towards his house. And all of a sudden I look at the front porch and there's a table, a tablecloth, there's pictures, there's his, his wife, his children. They were all there to greet me. He says, you're the first commissioner that's ever come to my farm. And he was almost, in, he, he, his eyes were a little teary. I mean, he, you know, and so we talked it through and even when we got done, he goes, yep, um, I'm all, I'll support the cap. What I needed to do was see if you come talk to me. Mm -hmm. And we talked it through. And But more than just the talking through, it really made me realize that that, that commit, and it's not the person, but you're right, but it's that position. But more so than I think any other, and I mean this, more than, you won't see that happening in other state agencies. People, I mean, it, it, because I've been in environmental affairs, I can, I'm, yeah, you're a secretary of that, but the commissioner of agriculture in Massachusetts, and I would probably say in New England, is it's a tight-knit group, and, you know, they, um, they really do look to the commissioner to be their advocate, to, to, to support, um, and, and, and are willing to disagree. I, I ran it, I mean, there were quite a few tensions, especially the second time around. I think they were expecting that, that I would do anything. And then we got into some issues around land use and, and, and mud, mud, mud vehicles on APR land, and it created some tension, but we still were able to, 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 to work that through. So I, I, I think that you've got to have um, that, uh, and you've got to be flexible. You, you really do. See, I, I think the thing that helped me, particularly with agriculture, is I didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had to ask all the time and what, what, and, and I, I think I'm honest and I think this is right when I say this, um, they, because one of them said, but you're, you're asking the right questions. Mm -hmm. You're asking the right questions. And so you, you kind of, you know, you understand where we come from. So it's not a matter of your, we, we don't fault you for not knowing, but, but, but you, 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 you know what you need to know. And you're also acknowledging what you don't know. And you're looking towards building solutions, which is foundationally not necessarily the way. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of people in positions and things are. And I mean, I think that's, that's right. really it, it just you said you need to be, you know, committed and willing to be poor. But you know, and those are nice. I think you know, for you it was Bucky, but the understanding that there is this thing called life, which is the matrix within which we all exist, and um is intimately interrelated with everything else um i yeah. know I think that's, a, that's an important framework as far as i'm concerned it's a it, very important framework and it's also what's important is that and this was hard i mean it, believe me people at new alchemy said they couldn't understand and i meant this why i was leaving to do this thing in government because government is messy it's tedious at new alchemy every saturday i could stand in front of um in some cases, right, scores of people, maybe hundreds of people, yeah. and say what it was exactly that I wanted to say. I could say this is what you know, and and um, there were and there, but I didn't have the necessarily the ability to see everything through. Mm -hmm. Working for government, what happened was I had to realize I'm not speaking for myself, and I'm speaking for the person. You know, it's like a hierarchy, right? Not even for the and and. Um, the process is messy and the process is tedious, but, but if you can find this, this is again, this is what I mean. If you then begin to see how the system works, you can actually get things done. You can, and, and it certainly happened in agriculture, certainly happened when I was in economic affairs with John Todd and folks at New Alchemy, 
had these great technologies, but nobody <laughs> like knew they didn't understand them, right? Just because we have the answers doesn't mean anybody's willing to. <laughs> yeah, but plowing through yeah. the bureaucracy and yeah. helping you wade through it um, was a tremendous help to people like John. And I think that people who are doing important, particularly important science and, and, and research who probably look askance, right, at government and politics, and I make... And, and this could be just me, but I, I make a distinction between politics and government. And, mm -hmm. and I think that I know that they're intimately linked, but I think that people forget that there are and some incredible public servants who do what Civil they servants. do. Right. I mean, that's been my experience growing up in the organic community and sort of thumbing our nose at the university system and this and the, you know, USDA and all that kind of stuff. Like, I was just sort of brought up that they were the other, they were the, you know, if not enemy, certainly adversarial in their intent. And my experience has been going down and meeting with some national program leaders in DC is like, wow, like I've had a hard time finding any of them who was anything but open-hearted and well-intentioned and entirely supporting what I thought were honorable and appropriate causes. And then, you know, NRCS people around the country and, and other researchers at universities. And I mean, I just, I do think it's a very important point about about politics and and um, government and civil and, servants and, in many and cases. Policy, yeah. And I mean, policy is a very powerful tool. I mean, you know, again, once again, it can be very subtle. I mean, farmers markets could happen right away in Boston, um, and I'm not sure because I know this doesn't exist everywhere because I've talked to other states. But we have a law in the book that says if you grow it yourself, you don't need a license or a permit to sell it. I mean, it could, if you had to get a license or, you know, I'm saying it, it would be an extra bureaucratic step and would cost you money. And in some cases, that's what you have to do in other states, but it's been on the books. It's never been erased. And, um, and we made it a point to make sure that policy stayed that, um, and you could be a farmer, you could be a backyard gardener, you could be a community gardener, but you just, if you grow whatever it is that you're growing yourself, then um, you can sell without a permit, which became a point of, contention early on with the markets because we um, the whole idea of um, uh, people trying to sneak in what stuff that they picked up just to kind of supplement what yeah. they did. How do you police that? And what we would say is, if we want to maintain, first of all, I said, we're, we'll make the market a pure market. Farmer's markets, when I was doing, had to be a pure farmer's market. The, if you can grow it, you can't tell it. It was the way I was, the way I was brought up. Yeah, that's right. But, yeah. but, but still, if people question then what we would do is that we'll go out and visit the farm. Yeah. I mean, that's what we would do. Because if, if, if you didn't do that, then the confidence in the market begins to erode. If people yeah. feel that somebody, and I don't care, they say it could be a one outlier, but he's starting to abuse it, then that's going to open the door because it's going gonna, it's gonna to not just, first of all, it's unfair to the other farmers, right? Because they're selling stuff they didn't grow. But it's also the fear they, more than that, their fear was consumer confidence would go people would say, this isn't what I bargained for. And therefore it's not a farmer's market. So we, I, things have changed. I think there have been some, some more latitude recently, but I, those, are, those are major decisions. Those are big decisions in terms of how this thing is going to work. And most, not to say most, I, it, I think they're just, there is a degree of messiness when you start dealing with people that a lot of people would just rather not have to, deal with because it's just not neat yeah. and pretty but um you learn a lot i mean I, and to me that that that's kind of what it um the, the probably the biggest obstacle is developing those relationships and those relations well as you said you're a community organizer and that's what it's, it comes down to is is people relating yeah. and there's a theme across all those I, we have five minutes left and i just you know you you titled this presentation in search of integrity so in the in the few minutes that are remaining i just i'd love to see if you you know have any any broad overarching points you'd like to convey or share to those who may be watching in the future um maybe inspired by your story um well you know he, here's i think sometimes it gets um people are looking for sort of these hard sort of um, lessons. I will say, we, I did this with Dudley Street. We did talk about the lessons learned over, over, over the years. 
Um, and, you know, some of them are, are sort of obvious, but when it comes to integrity, I think it, 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 there's a couple of things, which is one of the reasons I was attracted to Bucky is that, I mean, the question he asked, and, and it's not just him. I mean, you can talk to, you know, any number of particularly biologists or, 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 or I would, you know, farmers that you work with, what's nature trying to do? Yeah. How do I, and, and here, it, I think it's a matter of sort of coming to the realization that we have a, we have a special role. Humans have a special role in the scheme of things. We haven't been doing very well. It's not to be dominant. It's not to dominate, but it's also not to be passive. It's not yeah. to say that we're going to sit back. We, we have to figure out how to become constructive participants in the process of evolution. I mean, I think that's, if you know, this is just me, sir. And so- no, Go, let it rip, let it rip, and, yeah. And, and so you have to be true to yourself and understanding what that means and not become sort of an ideologue, not become blinded because you think you know, because nature- doesn't work in a linear fashion, right? There are always these, these curveballs. So you've got to sort of say, my integrity says that, that uh, to me, part of the issue of integrity is connected to the, the probably one of the most powerful tools that we have that um, don't use nearly enough. And it's our intuition. Mm -hmm. Intuition is a part. The first book I read, I didn't know who Bucky was. The first book I read by, uh, by him was called Intuition. Mm -hmm. And he saw that as sort of this powerful insight into understanding kind of just that what it takes but but you you have to listen to it you can't if you fudge it if you try to if you try to say to say if you don't say guide it to what you want it to say instead of what it's really saying to you then it's destroyed it's not there you you've almost destroyed that that ultimate integrity that yeah. is that is a a, a compass right mm -hmm. to take you where um, we need to go. And I'll just on the, just finishing that because I've gotten a lot of trouble with my my colleagues in, in, in renewable energy when, when I say to them right now, um, there's no way that we're going to be able to meet um, greenhouse gas emission goals anywhere without, if, if all of us, if every country tries to go it alone and do it on its own, there, without some level of global cooperation. And that can be just based on our understanding of there just aren't enough resources for everyone to build the number of turbines, the number of solar panels that they need to meet their national goals. And so they 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 look at me and say, you're 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 critiquing the renewable energy movement in a way that could be harmful. And what I say to them, I'm critiquing in a way I think it's honest in terms yeah. of what our options are. And and to a certain extent, what you know, Bucky would often say, nature is bound and determined to make a success of us, but we have to listen. <laughs> and, 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 and what he meant by that, nature is sort of saying, get me out of, we, we need, you need to be a conscious participant in, yeah. in, in this. And, 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 and part of that is, and I'm not just saying this because part of that is the process of restoring soils. That is, that's something that we have to do with nature. And this is going to sound, I don't want to sound too anthropomorphic here, right? But and, and nature's way of doing a lot of that was with God's great plows, right? Mm -hmm. It was the glaciers. And, yeah. and, and the process of restoring and revitalizing, there was from, from our perspective, what we, could, what we might see as destruction. Certainly, it would be destruction of our stable, unmoving systems that are in place right now, right? The last ice age retreated 10,000 years ago. All of civilization as we know it, in terms of stationary buildings, stationary, big agriculture, has developed right in the interglacial and in retreat of the last one. Please don't. Somebody's gonna say, so "Are you trying to say that maybe the global warming prevented the next?" No, I'm not. I'm not well, probably did, but I'm not. That's not. The, but it's not. The, but you understand what I'm saying? That I, are, I think I do. Yeah, we didn't talk about fertilization. We didn't talk about all kinds of topics. Yeah, right. But there are functions that nature performs that um, that are and. and Look at fire, forest fires, controlled burning is one thing when I was at, I didn't even, you know, when the Nature Conservancy for about a year, that was one of the first times that we were experimenting with controlled burns. And some people got upset about that. But in essence, it really was um, scientists sort of saying, let's see what Gaia is trying to do. If we can do a good job of this, then maybe what we prevent are the, the, the un, I don't want, again, it's going to sound too human. But the unintentional, but the only way that nature can do it, I'm going to burn 
everything, right? Because I didn't really, I mean, you're gone. I'm going to restore the, yeah. the, the ecosystem and I'll do it with or without you. I prefer to do it with you. I really would prefer to do it with you because I think we can, I think we can raise consciousness. We can come to another level of understanding about all this all works with you as an agent working with me. But if you can't do it, and as a matter of fact, if you get a little bit too out of hand here, then I'll go back to square one and try, I'll try something else. Maybe, maybe I'll get those cockroaches once again. Maybe that's my successful thing. But I, I, I do believe all this. I believe that that's kind of what we have yeah. to figure out. And that's where the integrity comes in terms of listening to your inner voice and to your soul, hearing what's going on and not being drawn by what you want to hear, but what you really truly hear in terms of how we can make things work and particularly how we can make things work for everybody. Beautiful. I uh, just, yeah. <laughs> so we can end there. We can keep going for a long time. No, I think that's, that's yeah. lots of comments coming in gratitude and appreciation and mm -hmm inspiration um so well thank, thank you for the dan for the opportunity i can't believe we even though i keep saying right i'm, I'm passing the baton the baton but you and i will have our conversation we're gonna we're gonna get together right <laughs> it needs to happen. okay all right my thank friend. you thank you for thank coming. you very much oh, take yeah. care be well yeah